So uh, we're, we're now in the section of the course where we're looking at the various places that AI has been used and is being used and is showing up and is influencing things. So today we're going to take a look at AI and management. So artificial intelligence has been slowly finding its ways into the tools used by managers of organizations. For example, AI programs are used to screen job applicants and administer skills tests and then recommend the top candidates for interview. They track economic reports and they advise managers on emerging trends. They can screen emails for illicit behavior among employees. Not always the most favorite use of surveillance, but it is, it is used. They uh, automate warehouses and they can guide drones for reconnaissance and delivery. There's also been a lot of speculation that AI tools could take over manager jobs and manager responsibilities, such as budget formation, year-end projections and inventory management, and even employee performance evaluation. Well, today's speaker is Professor, distinguished Professor Uday Apte of the Defense Management School. He believes managers need to get to know the AI tools and use them wisely and productively. He also believes that the majority of a manager's job requires other capabilities like empathy, compassion, and judgment, which we know that AI is not good at. He's had a lot of experience in, uh, uh, with the issue of managing uh, technology and organizations. And one of his uh, <coughs> things that he'll assure you is that the there's no danger that a manager is going to be put out of a job anytime soon by AI. So, Professor Apte. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here, but although I should say that uh, having heard uh, the experts in uh, AI, uh, I really ha know about it mainly as a user perspective or as a management perspective. But even, even then, I believe that it is really an important way uh, to think about uh, those things, to know that. So today, what we plan to do are essentially uh, three things. One is just introduction, just to get going. And then two main things I want to talk about, mainly the second one, which is uh, what are the managerial impl implications of using artificial intelligence? And secondly, uh, what are the policy implications? Because ultimately, uh, you may be a, a manager of a particular organization, but you also should always keep in mind the policy perspectives because uh, suddenly you may be doing things that do not fit well for the society at large, and therefore you would be in trouble. So you have to think about those things too. So let's look at that. Now to begin with, uh, as we all realize now, we really live in a wonderland today. We have these uh, self-driving cars, smart, smart speakers, and image recognition technology. And you guys have, of course, heard a lot about that, uh, mainly from an engineering perspective. Uh, but it is true that it is really a wonderland because these are the things that I could never imagine uh, 25 or 30 years ago that we could be living in this world in terms of amount of computing power we have or uh, all the things that can be done using AI today. Uh, whether we know it or not, AI has very much entered our day-to-day -day life. We can think about uh, the smart speakers, maybe Alexa, Echo Dot, or whatever it is. Uh, those are all uh, AI applications. So what I really believe is that as a manager, uh, you really uh, need to think carefully about how to make best use of the technology. Uh, that's the first. And then uh, implementing, ultimately, the, uh, the most challenging feature there is the how you manage the implementation. Because you may have uh, great ideas, you may have great technology and products and so forth. If you don't implement it right, ultimately, it's of no use. So uh, thinking about this particular field, uh, technology management, it is uh, mainly about uh, understanding uh, value of certain technology and then figuring it out uh, how to use it in the best possible way uh, given the mission of any organization. So uh, be it a private sector or DOD or any uh, governmental organization, ultimately you need to think about that. So you, you need to manage many different aspects in the life cycle 
of a technology all the way from uh, planning for it, designing it, uh, implementing it and ultimately after you have implemented it, operating and controlling it. So, you have to ultimately manage all these things and as, as we all know, <coughs> if you really look at it, managers do not do anything themselves they get it done through others. So, that is really the whole idea of a management, but ultimately uh, you have to know how things work, otherwise you will not be able to manage others who actually will work with the things. So, so those are some of the things you have to uh, keep in mind and uh, past experience has shown uh, in many, many different ways. I used to work with uh, manufacturing automation, robotics and uh, FMS and variety of other things and uh, the exam, the experience was very clear that you may have wonderful technology that you bought from somewhere or developed in house. If you don't implement it right or don't make best use of it, it is all useless. Your money is down the drain. Ultimately, you have to keep uh, that in mind. So, implementation makes all the difference and that's the most important responsibility for a manager. So, let's look at what are the managerial implications. Essentially, uh, I think there are at least three ways and there could be more ways, but at least three ways uh, you can think about using uh, AR to further the mission of the organization. First, of course, obvious, which is uh, your product and services, whatever they may be, uh, using AI to really uh, creating and delivering those products and services in the best possible way. That's the first and major uh, use, but many times you don't think about uh, how uh, to make use of it uh, in internal sense, which is external perspectives for the customers in terms of what you deliver, uh, products or services. You have to think about how to use it uh, internally uh, in your own organization and ultimately it boils down to uh, adjusting uh, the jobs that people do in your organization. Uh, so, and then of course, once you make those adjustments, you have to make sure that you, you select the right people, you train them right way uh, and, and so on and so forth. And the third uh, item that you have to keep in mind is that uh, you have to ultimately uh, change the decision making process because that is the heart of AI that the uh, computers have been around for a long time, information systems have been around for several decades too of course, but the AI what brings it to the table is ability to make decisions and therefore you have to think about uh, how to incorporate that in your overall decision making process. So, I would suggest that these are the things you should keep in mind because uh, whether one likes it or not, uh, when one starts out in a career as an engineer, uh, sooner or later you end up becoming a manager. I mean, that's how the career progression goes and therefore you have to keep these things in mind definitely as you go forward in your own career. So, let's take a look at uh, these three things. Now, uh, I would submit that you have already heard a lot about how to use AI uh, with if to uh, support the mission of DOD and you will be hearing a lot more about that and so in a way I don't want to say much about the first one, uh, you already know quite a bit. So, uh, if nothing else, uh, basically if you think about future of warfare, at least in my uh, layman's uh, language, uh, it is not necessarily a contact warfare, but yeah, so think about a non-contact warfare and in that sense, there are many, many technologies that ultimately are going to come about, uh, just to name a few, uh, electronic warfare, robotics, unmanned systems of all kinds, cyberspace, space, laser and you can make a whole, uh, whole string of that, but ultimately uh, they all incorporate, will incorporate definitely uh, AI and ultimately all these technologies have to work together because they are not necessarily standalone and that is one important message to keep in mind that AI is not a standalone technology. Ultimately, you have to use it along with other technologies and there has to be a good level of integration, otherwise it is never going to work. So, uh, that is something that we need to keep and of course, as we said earlier, it is definitely necessary in making all kinds of decisions in the organization, uh, screening candidate, testing them, training them and so forth. So, moving on, uh, let me uh, uh, suggest you, uh, 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 in a way, a uh, hypothesis, I would not say that I have definitely proven it as yet through my research, uh, but uh, quite some time ago, uh, I would say uh, almost 30 years ago when I started my academic career, I looked at uh, outsourcing and in those days, uh, 30 years ago, 
uh, global outsourcing became a big wave uh, in the corporate world. Meaning to say, uh, if, if you are developing information systems, why do you have to do it here, which can cost a lot of money? Why don't we send it to Ireland or maybe Philippines or India, wherever? And you can do it at less than half the cost and quality could, would be as good. So therefore, global outsourcing uh, became a big thing. So at that time, uh, in my research, and I have cited here in 1995 article, where I tried to understand uh, what what work is, what do we really do in any occupations and uh, essentially my uh, thought on that uh, has been and still is, is that whatever we do, it uh, does not matter what kind of job you do, there are three things that you generally do. One, essentially dealing with information, manipulation of information of all kinds and of course deciding, making decisions on that. Second is about material manipulation, we manipulate material, we move it from here to there or transform it in machining or whatever, but material manipulation is the second kind of activity. And the third one is uh, dealing with people, it could be people within your own organization, it could be uh, your customers. So essentially uh, whatever we do, if you look at uh, every minute of the day in eight hour of any job, you can always see what is happening. Of course, it is not to say that you do only either this or that, there is always uh, intersection too. So in a, in a Venn diagram sense, you can think of uh, activities at a fundamental level, there are three things that we do. Uh, dealing with the information, manipulating materials and uh, interacting with other human beings in the organization or the customers. Those are the three things and if you like, uh, as I have done in the past, I studied uh, eight hours of a day in a particular job and I tried to find out. Uh, I used to work for an insurance company a long time ago. So I found out that a claims analyst for an insurance company spends 60% uh, of the time dealing with information and so on and so forth. So you can actually count and the amount of time you take uh, to do a particular kind of uh, three of those activities, how much time you spend and uh, that leads to a simple understanding. Uh, a job could be information intensive, a job could be customer contact intensive or it could be material manipulation intensive. So you can characterize jobs in that manner too. Now the idea of course is that if you are, uh, if your job is highly information intensive and you don't really deal much with customers or with material, then those jobs do not have to be done uh, here in the US. They can go uh, elsewhere and that's what we have seen in the last uh, 20 or 20, 30 years that uh, more than half of the jobs have gone abroad and my thesis in those days was something to the tune of 15 percent of the jobs uh, would be lost because of global outsourcing because if you look at different nature of the job, you could see which jobs are going to disappear fairly soon somewhere else. Now uh, the same logic actually can be used now that uh, fast forward 25, 30 years ago and now we have AI on the scene. So if in a very simple way, if you think about it, uh, maybe in the last 100 years, machines came on the scene and they automated material manipulation part of the jobs. So automated machines of all kinds, they took care of that. Then computers came on the scene uh, and then information manipulation portions of the job uh, went away uh, to the computers. And now, uh, of course, uh, therefore you need to do less amount of, spend less amount of time doing those particular activities. Uh, but we still had, uh, uh, and now that uh, AI has come on the scene, that information manipulation, uh, in fact, is at much, much higher risk of disappearing because it is not just about acquiring, analyzing information, but making decisions. So uh, what I think, and again, as I said, uh, this is still at a research stage, but I really believe that just like Manufacturing automation, really our manufacturing related jobs disappeared. Now with the computers and AI, good portion of the jobs that are deal with information manipulation, decision making are going to disappear. Luckily, uh, we'll still have things to do, meaning to say dealing with other human beings, luckily the computers or AI is not going to be able to do that well. So uh, in some way those jobs or those kinds of activities will still remain uh, with us for a long, long time to come. Of course, who knows what future holds, but I really believe that because of that, uh, it is really uh, all the jobs are slowly being 
redefined in some way that material manipulation activities go to computer uh, automated machines, the information manipulation activities go to computers and, uh, and AI, not in 100 percent way by any stretch of imagination, but slowly that portion of jobs get uh, cut out and given it to the automation. But the dealing with information, dealing with other human beings will still be there because that is something that luckily computers do not do as well. So, uh, therefore, uh, uh, some work that I have done in the past uh, many years, past few decades is uh, I study uh, how to manage uh, operations in information economy. That has been one of my research topics and so forth and there are many things that I have done there. But essentially what I saw, uh, if you say that 100, 150 years ago we lived in manufacturing economy, currently we live in information economy. Meaning to say, uh, when I studied uh, the GNP of the US, you could see that about two thirds of the GNP and approximately the same percentage of jobs are dealing with information. So, two thirds of the jobs and GNP money creation is dealing with information. So, we live today in information economy, it might be information intensive services or products and so forth, but that I believe uh, will change. Uh, certainly in the next uh, 20, 30 years, perhaps uh, I, I will not be working anymore, but it is in your working life that you would see the transformation of the economy and the corresponding job, the ability to create money, all those things are going to change and they are going to gravitate towards uh, dealing with other human beings. So, I would, uh, this is not necessarily a term uh, that is the best in my mind, but I would call it a human centered economy. That is where we are, economic evolution is going forward. So. What you need to think about is that ultimately the jobs will involve more of uh, interpersonal activities, dealing with other people, having empathy, having uh, feelings and so forth. So, those kinds of jobs will grow uh, in, in general and of course, it has uh, dramatic implications of you as a, as a manager for sure. Now, uh, this is uh, what I am talking about of course, is more applicable or imaginable possibly uh, within not uh, in the civilian uh, part of DOD, perhaps not necessarily in the active duty part, but in the civilian part of the economy which is just a mirror image of the broader economy, the jobs are going to change. Now, if the jobs are redefined, ultimately you have to pick the right people. That will of course, happen by definition. So, if you think that the, the empathy that one can show, have be understand and deal with other people better, then of course, you need to make sure that you pick that kind of a person for that particular job and uh, this is just a, uh, just a possibility is that ultimately we know that uh, uh, women are better at those kinds of things than men. So, you can clearly see that perhaps the percentage of women is going to grow and so on and so forth. So, you can of course, conjecture many different things for what will happen 20, 30 years from now, but I really believe that the occupations will gravitate towards interpersonal and empathetic task and therefore, you have to make adjustments to the jobs, the selection process, the training, uh, performance evaluations and everything else that goes with it. So, you have to keep uh, this broader train uh, in mind. Now, uh, the other, uh, other thing that as I mentioned, uh, you have to keep in mind that how do you uh, improve your decision making given that now you have AI tools available. Of course, human beings are still there, managers regardless of what level they are, human beings are always there to make decision making. Now, that AI is also on the scene. So, you could do that in many different ways. Now, uh, as I think about it, there are uh, strengths and weaknesses about decision making capabilities of human beings versus uh, AI systems and uh, this is just a, a rough cut at that, but let us think about it at least on five different uh, dimensions, uh, decision making conditions and how AI based decisions are being made and how humans decision making capabilities are. So, if you think about uh, having the decision search space which is uh, specificity. Now, of course, uh, AI really requires a well specified uh, decisions per se. If things are extremely vague, then AI just would not be able to do that, but that is not so with human beings. We can deal with vagueness absolutely well. So, uh, we can accommodate in our decision making loosely defined decisions. So, human beings are better at that compared to a high well specified decision search page, AI is better at that. If you think about uh, ability to uh, interpret the decision making processes and outcomes, Again, in that case, 
uh, human beings, uh, you can explain how the decisions are made. Of course, it is not to say that the explanation you give is necessarily the accurate one. Perhaps uh, there is always a, a retrospective decision making. You sort of justify how you decided, but you could explain whether it is right or not doesn't matter, but you can explain. But that is not so uh, when it comes to AI based decision making because many a times uh, given that uh, most of the AI systems use uh, a deep learning and that uh, ultimately means that uh, you could uh, think about the outcome and test it, whether the quality of outcome or decision is good or bad, but you don't really know how the process happened. You can't really explain how that, what, which particular process was there. Explainability is a big trouble there. Now, on the other three, uh, how many alternatives are you trying to think about to pick the right one? In that case, of course, uh, AI, given the tremendous computing power that is available. Uh, generally speaking, AI can accommodate very, very large, huge millions of possibilities. They can analyze it very quickly. Not so with the human being because we have limited capability in terms of thinking about, as we all know, uh, when you have several decisions to make, soon enough, you don't, uh, you are not able to distinguish which is better, which is not. Everything starts to look the same when you have too many alternatives that are facing you, which are very similar to each other. We just cannot decide. So uh, we cannot uniformly evaluate large alternative sets as human beings. If you think about speed, without question, uh, AI supported by tremendous computing uh, capability can really do things very speedily and ultimately we are definitely slow at that because it takes time for us to understand the information and make decisions about that. Uh, same thing about replicability. Machine is a machine. You can replicate exactly uh, the same. If you give the same data, you're going to come up with the same answer. It's not so uh, with the human being. Today, based on this, you would decide that, but tomorrow it may be different. So replicability is not that great when it comes to human decision making. But now, if you compare these two, depending on the kind of decisions you need to make, the kind of uh, decision search space you have, the alternatives you have in the situation you face, now you can combine these two things in the best possible way to ultimately make better decision. That's the basic uh, idea here. So uh, if nothing else, I can think of uh, three different ways, and there may be more ways, of course. Uh, one is, of course, uh, you can delegate the entire decision making uh, to AI. Ultimately, we as human beings, manager, you are always responsible. Ultimately, you are responsible for everything, but you delegate the entire decision making process to artificial intelligence. And so uh, there are many systems that are already there you, of course, would recognize. For example, uh, we know about uh, detection of uh, fraud, the online system, the banks have it for a long time now, where suddenly they would call you saying that there is some activity which does not seem to be normal for you, and therefore, are you sure you did those transactions on credit card and so forth? So those exist. You have uh, recommender, recommender kinds of systems. You go to Amazon or Netflix and whatever else, uh, the, the enterprises recommend you. Maybe since you like that, you may also like this. So recommendation kinds of systems. So those are all uh, situations where you use uh, AI for the most part. So uh, decision making is delegated uh, to a AI. That is one situation. But for the most part, ultimately, it is going to be the hybrid uh, decision making. And I can think of uh, at least two hybrids. One is where uh, human intelligence is augmented by uh, AI decision making in the first and the other way around in the second kind of hybrid. So hybrids could be of two types. So uh, let's think about the first type where you let, uh, you give the data and the alternatives to AI systems first and they uh, screen it and give you a small subset of decisions to think about uh, to human beings and then human beings can look at those small subset and then make uh, the decisions. And there are these systems that are of course uh, currently around now, for example, many of the hiring or uh, loan application uh, kinds of things or outsourced uh, innovation uh, kinds of context where, where an organization has some problems and they announce it on the web. This is the problem. Uh, do you have any solutions for that? And there may be hundreds or uh, thousands of different people will come up with different solutions. And uh, then given the number of solutions that may be submitted, is, it might be good to use AI first to screen them out and a few remaining ones are being evaluated and decided upon by the human being. So that is the first uh, type of a hybrid, a human intelligence augmented by AI. The other type is just the way other, other are, that human beings first uh, do the screening and then uh, AI 
does the thorough investigation of those small uh, subset. Now, if you think about uh, health monitoring is one, where as we know, uh, the simple bodily functions, temperature, blood pressure and so forth, uh, ultimately you have to monitor it all the time over long uh, period of time, uh, then perhaps you, make, you can make good judgment as to what is wrong with a particular intensive care patient. So in that case, uh, uh, doctors would first uh, screen and decide we need to really observe uh, blood pressure. That's what we need to do and then let AI monitor that and alert or come up with some, uh, some diagnosis as to what might be wrong and so forth. So uh, you would use uh, human's ability uh, to smartly uh, create a small subset of, our, of uh, possibilities and then let AI do the further investigation, especially uh, the investigation requires a huge amount of data over long periods of time, then it is best that AI will do well, as we know from the previous comparison of abilities of those two things, humans versus uh, AI systems. So you can think of health monitoring where uh, first human beings, then AI. That particular hybrid might work well. So what I suggest is that think about at least these three and there may be more uh, different kinds of hybrids that you could create and so forth uh, in that case. Perhaps both could be done in parallel and then somebody else would arbitrate between that in terms of voting or whatever else. You can think of uh, many different things but that is the way you can adjust your decision making. Now uh, let's think about uh, implementation of AI because as I started out, uh, I, as I said, ultimate difference in success or failure is really made by how you implement things. So uh, you, you should, of course, take it extremely seriously how you do the implementation of your AI systems. Now, uh, looking at the recent study uh, that was done actually published just this year, uh, what has happened? Uh, the data shows, and of course, this is all uh, business world. These guys did not really study what happened in the DOD or whatever. They studied the open literature available uh, in the uh, business world. Uh, there is a mounting evidence of AI failure. That significant percentage of applications have totally failed. So that is one thing you have to keep in mind. So ultimately, and there is a big gap between AI ambition and execution. Uh, and uh, I'm not really surprised because most of the technologies uh, there is a, a phenomenon of hype, that there's a big hype above the technology, then you go to the post hype, and then you, you be, become more realistic. So I personally believe that just like you had a huge hype about uh, M, uh, ERP systems in mid 90s, and of course uh, the jury is actually by now it is not out, it's very clear that a large percent of ERP systems have totally failed. In fact, I was, you may or may not, you may already know about it, but in my view, uh, in DOD, we really haven't made good use of ERP at all. We have, have spent billions of dollars, but we have not really have good result to show for those ERP systems. Why? It was not well implemented. Not that there is something wrong with the technology. Technology are all good, but if you don't implement it right, then ultimately you don't get the benefit of having spent uh, billions of dollars. Same thing with AI, I really believe that there is a huge hype. Of course, it's bound to happen. For the first few years, there is a huge hype. Now, uh, of course, soon enough, you realize that, no, it's all a hype. This is really what the real thing is all about. And then you move forward. So I think we have just entered that state, where now we have realistic expectations about AI and what it can or cannot uh, do. The other thing uh, that is that is found in those case studies is that, as I said earlier, AI is not a standalone technology. You have to integrate it with many, many other technologies. And of course, fundamentally, without data, uh, AI cannot exist. So there are many, many other systems have to be well integrated uh, with AI to really make it work. And these are some of the areas where at least the businesses seem to be applying AI, smart services, office automation, management support, smart products, manufacturing automation, customer interface, automated, and so forth. So these are some of the typical applications that we see in those 100 odd different case studies that these people did. And the major implementation challenges as uh, through a fairly large uh, survey that they conducted, and these are fairly obvious too. The, the most important one is of course lack of skilled staff was the uh, biggest challenge that the companies faced. The second one of course is the not having the right knowledge. Managers do not really understand how these technologies work. So knowledge of the digital technologies was the second challenge. Uh, not being able to uh, do things quickly. We, uh, agility being very low, that was one challenge. And there is generally, uh, anytime you try to do something new, 
there is always a resistance about change. That is the nature of human being, that anything new, there is, you will always find that you huge resistance to, even if that new thing is really great, there will be a resistance. So internal resistance was another uh, big challenge. And of course, the other ones, uh, cyber security risk, there is not good enough amount of support from the leaders and so forth. So this is, these are the results of the case studies. You might want to keep that in mind as you start thinking about implementing uh, AI. Uh, one particular mnemonic that these researchers uh, proposed, and that seemed to make uh, sense. So uh, I propose that think about uh, digital as a guideline for uh, successfully uh, uh, applying and implementing uh, AI. And uh, the digital stand, each of those words, of course, sometimes it is a little bit construed, but it doesn't matter. These seven things, if you keep, make use of them properly, ultimately, uh, these are the success factors, and you are likely to succeed if you manage these seven things well. The first and the foremost is, of course, data. Uh, having the relevant data, large number of data, is a large amount of data is very, very critical because as we see uh, from the image recognition world, for example, as I understand from general reading, uh, Google uh, use, uses something to the tune of uh, 300 million images to really understand uh, facial recognitions and so forth. So 300 million is, uh, images is a huge amount of data. So ultimately, data is going to be absolutely critical for application of AI, so you have to keep that in mind, for sure. How do you collect it? How do you keep it in an integrated manner? So on and so forth. Accurate, updated, and all that. Second thing is, of course, uh, be intelligent about using these things, so therefore, your uh, managerial or technical skills should be up to date, and you have to have, organization has to have a, a good digital strategy, and then within that strategy, how AI fits within that. You have to keep uh, that in mind. And uh, then uh, be grounded. Meaning to say, uh, don't go crazy and uh, think about a pie in the sky kind of application right in the beginning. Start small, then uh, test it, learn from it, and then slowly go to the next level and the next level. So be grounded in whatever that you do. So that is a, a, that is a third one. Of course, uh, integration matters hugely in all these things. So the systems have to be integrated, data has to be integrated, uh, and so forth. Data repository, digitized businesses processes, who really can talk to each other uh, very well, and so forth. Ultimately, uh, teams uh, using B teaming or use uh, teams, whether it is uh, uh, in uh, multifunctional teams on do, for doing things in your own organization, or it might be teaming up uh, with your partners in the supply chain. So uh, teaming is very important. Uh, then of course agility, don't need to say much, being able to move quickly. Ultimately, you have to be better than your competition. That is what ultimately matters, you have to keep track of that. And finally, uh, last but not the least is the management. Ultimately, the leaders uh, have to be comfortable with the new technology, and they should be supportive of these changes that are being proposed, because if the management support is not there, then nothing is ever going to work. So the researchers suggest these seven things, which are the critical success factors for uh, uh, AI system implementation, and I think uh, that makes good amount of uh, sense. So now, uh, having covered uh, what managers should think about and do, uh, let's move very uh, quickly and briefly uh, through the policy implications of AI because uh, to the extent AI has entered uh, your day-to-day -day life, so therefore, uh, if it is not done right, then we are going to land into a lot of trouble. So ultimately, we, have, we already f see that uh, in the world where Facebook and so forth and uh, what is happening today, uh, AI is a, a next level of that. So we really have to be mindful of all kinds of policy implications that we should keep in mind. So uh, to begin with, uh, the surveys have shown that people generally are worried about three things when it comes to AI. The first one is that human beings are being replaced by AI. Of course, that's naturally you're losing your own job. So people are concerned about that. The second thing is uh, based on what people have learned, uh, people have seen or read about learning system, the notion of a singularity means that a runaway progress that the uh, AI can make, and soon enough, they'll far surpass the human capability because these are learning systems. So they can reach so high up in terms of their abilities that human beings are really left as subordinates uh, to uh, AI systems. So that is the second singularity is very near. And ultimately, like any tool, any technology, it can be used in a good way or a bad way, so AI can be abused. So that is the third fear uh, that people have. So ultimately, regulations, or policies are about 
dealing with those three things. That is what ultimately it boils down to. And uh, the uh, people have been studying and uh, some of the research being done in the, our uh, School of Defense Management is about how the nature of occupations is changing and what it might mean in terms of the loss of jobs and so forth. The estimates so far, mostly from the consulting world, such as McKinsey's and so forth, is that uh, 10 to 15 percent at the low end to 40 to 50 percent of the jobs are at risk at the high end of estimates. Of course, uh, uh, that gives you an idea as to uh, what might happen, what might we be faced with maybe in 20 or 30 years from now. Not today, but 20, 30 years from now. So there are many policy options. Of course, some of them are quite well known. For example, joint uh, training programs, universities joining hands with the industry. Uh, all kinds of training programs. Uh, there could be uh, regulation uh, with respect to employment, and these have been tried uh, somewhere else in the world, perhaps in Europe and so forth. Uh, for example, uh, you say that if you are going to save money uh, through automation and the jobs are being reduced, then certain percentage of money that the organization save by cutting out jobs should be spent to training of people so that they become uh, fit for the future kinds of jobs. So training, so use certain percentage of money saved for training of employees. The next one would be uh, uh, distribution, sort of an idea uh, perhaps in France or wherever else, where uh, if in case the total amount of work that needs to be done by human being goes down, then you reduce the number of hours that you work. Instead of working 40 hours a week, you work only for 35 or whatever else. So distribute the work evenly, reduce the length of the uh, day, working days. So that is uh, another solution that has been talked about. The other ones are uh, with respect to algorithms, AI algorithms themselves. Now going back to uh, what we, uh, uh, what I said earlier, and as you have definitely uh, learned from the other uh, lectures here, it is that uh, the AI decision making is only as good as the data that it gets used. Uh, if the data that is being fed is not realistic, then the decision making that gets done is again uh, not realistic. Uh, it is very well known, uh, at least in some of the recent research, is that uh, many of the uh, a vision system that uh, uh, that self-driving cars use, uh, they are not so good. Uh, uh, they are good at uh, recognizing uh, uh, people with lighter skin tones, but they are not so good at uh, recognizing uh, human beings with the darker skin tone because that's the data. Therefore, that's what uh, they are good at recognizing. So ultimately, data has to be good. So if that's the case, then of course there may be need to be uh, self-regulation that companies themselves uh, make sure that the data that is being used uh, to train AI system is reflective of the market that they are dealing with. But if the companies don't do it willingly, then of course uh, the government may need to move in in terms of uh, how uh, uh, AI uh, programs get trained and how they are used. So those, those regulations may come about. Ultimately, uh, just like doctors and lawyers have a moral codex, they take an oath that yeah, I shall do this, I shall not do that kind of thing. Same thing, uh, perhaps the AI professionals may need to uh, think along those lines. You may also need to think about uh, the big problem that really are not exactly uh, solved as of now, and I'm not sure they can be solved uh, through any kind of regulation at all. Uh, explainability, as I mentioned, that uh, outputs can, can be tested but the processes, you cannot, they're completely opaque. Now, of course, sometimes the organization may want to keep it opaque uh, because they don't want others to know how exactly they're doing things, but in many other cases where you do need to know uh, how the processes are working. For example, uh, in case of uh, uh, healthcare, uh, diagnostic kind of systems. Now, perhaps uh, the AI-based uh, diagnostic system says that looking at the images, uh, skin cancer and so forth, now, uh, a person who actually is diagnosed that way would like to know how is it that uh, that particular diagnosis came about or imaging uh, brain and coming out with the idea of a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. Uh, how do you uh, do that? You should be able to explain the process, how that per conclusion was reached. So in many cases, it is necessary that we also understand process, not just the outcome. And uh, of course, uh, now it is also well known that uh, AI systems tend to be very fragile because uh, if in case they are faced with the data that is completely different than what they were trained on, uh, then uh, their ability to make uh, decisions completely falls apart. So they are very fragile in that sense. Now these two things, uh, how one deals with the uh, regulation, I'm not very sure about, but one should definitely keep that in mind because ultimately those are the problems and people are going to be concerned about those problems, so solutions have to be found for those. 
There are many other uh, things that people have been talking about, and uh, one, uh, one particular regulation that came about in Europe uh, very recently is the general data protection regulation, where you are, uh, being able to use or not use personal data. That is what ultimately this regulation deals with. Now, of course, uh, in the US, uh, we, are, uh, we try to limit the amount of restrictions you place on the data that can be used by corporations, personal data that can be used by corporation to make decisions, but that may change. So those kinds of things come about. And on the other end, you have uh, China, where uh, AI and the big data is being used mostly as a big brother a sense. In a way, you can uh, recognize who is a good citizen and who is not, and therefore their, uh, uh, their movement can be restricted. So those systems are coming on, on the scene uh, as we speak. So uh, that particular area, one has to uh, think about and balancing economic growth and personal privacy. So those are, again, challenges that we are definitely to face. So at this point, I think this would be a very good time for me to stop. And if in case you have any questions or so forth, I'd be happy to answer.